I realize that I cut everybody short on lunch, but we're going to go ahead and get started uh, with the conversation. And so our next panel uh, group that's up is our content providers. So you guys go, you know your order, so go for it. I guess I'm, I'm up. Okay, You're up. On this end of the panel. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jay Diskey. I'm Executive Director of the K-12 Division at the Association of American Publishers. I appreciate the opportunity to present to the board. My brief uh, presentation today encompasses uh, three pro topics and touches on many of the questions posed by the board. First topic is, who are today's educational publishers? Wh who are they, what are they, and what space do they work in? Uh, number two, today's instructional programs, how have they changed, how are they uh, meeting the challenge of digital learning and personalized learning. And the third topic is the policy and regulatory environment in which today's companies work. In terms of uh, today's educational publishers, they are a diverse array of companies and organizations dedicated to improving student learning through the development of quality content, innovative tools, and technologies. My division, AAP, has approximately 150 members, ranging from very large companies that develop products in a variety of subjects across many grades. We have other smaller members that develop products only for a portion of the market, for example, for the pre-K market or language arts or uh, a specific foreign language. Uh, though some of the members of my division, AAP, uh, may still consider themselves to be publishers, many have evolved into technology companies and call themselves something else now. Nevertheless, uh, I think it's safe to say that they're all involved in creating innovative <laughs> solutions and tools, technologies, content uh, for, the, uh, for this industry. Most of the companies publish in both digital and print. However, there are some that work purely in the digital space. Uh, and I'm sure that there are a few that are still uh, making that uh, transition, <laughs> particularly smaller companies, uh, from print to digital. In terms of topic number two, what are these products? Uh, I think the best way to talk about them is that uh, these learning resources are designed to instruct, assess, and diagnose. And they have many features, many important features, that the old Basel textbook of old uh, didn't have, although there are some features, such as standards alignment, that we find common. But for example, uh, data analytics, assessment features, these are very important features of new digital programs. Uh, obviously, there's different types of support, content, and material for teachers. Uh, obviously, quality content for all type of learners is prevalent in these products. There's also accessibility features for children with special needs. And finally, keep in mind that digital programs must be capable of meeting a variety of technical uh, specifications. In fact, uh, an ever-changing number of technical specifications. So in other words, what was the primary tool in the classroom? The Basel textbook has evolved into a sophisticated, innovative digital tool that serves as a uh, resource for both the, both the learner and the teacher. Topic number three, what is the policy and regulatory environment uh, in which these companies work? Uh, first and foremost, a number of the features that I described just a moment ago uh, that we find prevalent in products also work their way into uh, specifications at the state and local level are requirements. For example, standards alignment, a key requirement. A research base. Also, uh, various types of content and teacher supports. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, technical and manufacturing specifications. Efficacy, proof that the program is effective, is often required. And finally, there's federal accessibility requirements of various sorts. And all of these are the things that the companies in this space uh, must comply with. It's often a long list of state and local requirements and specifications. Frankly, at AAP, we feel that no one should get a free pass. I say that because uh, developers of open content, for example, uh, they certainly should have to comply with the same standards, the same requirements, and the same regulations. <clears throat> Uh, that companies, uh, whether for-profit or non-profit, in this space have to comply with. Another common feature of the uh, regulatory environment are obviously adoptions, both at the state and local level. And these two, just like the market and just like products, have been changing uh, quite a bit over the past 10 to 15 years to accommodate the things that we're talking about, to accommodate digital programs, to accommodate accessibility, 
and in some cases, number three, to accommodate more flexibility that school districts want uh, so that they can use the money for uh, technology purchases or other type of purchases that may enhance learning in the classroom. We recognize that new types of products and changes in the market can and often do require modifications to statutes and regulations. We have seen that over the years, and we know that going forward, policy will need to change. Uh, frankly, over the past, I think, six to eight years in particular, adoptions have changed in some, some significant ways. They needed to be updated in a whole host of ways for digital learning. Going forward, we see this, for example, with the student data privacy issue. Uh, 36 states have passed student data privacy laws in the past two to three years. I'm sure the other ones, the remaining 14, will consider such legislation uh, as well. Uh, Madam Chair, you asked me specifically for some information a couple of months ago or several months ago on the status of uh, state adoptions, and I thought uh, in closing I would give just a brief summary of where things stand nationwide. Uh, the current tally is that 19 of the 50 states uh, have adoptions at the same level. Two states, Indiana and Arkansas, recently repealed their adoption statutes. Indiana did so in uh, 2011. Arkansas did so in 2013. Uh, even though there's 19 adoption states, by no means are all of these adoption states of the same sort. Uh, some adoption states require purchases off of a list, and those lists are often called required or recommended. Uh, other states use what we call an advisory process, where a state puts out a list and advises school districts. This is what you can buy from uh, if you wish to. And there's various shades of gray uh, with each. There have been some major shifts just in the past several years in state adoption processes. Uh, for example, in California, uh, the recession and its aftermath led the state to make a number of changes to its adoption process. Adoptions have moved out of that required or recommended category into an advisory process. Also four years ago, the instructional materials categorical uh, in California was eliminated with virtually all other education categories as a total rewrite of education finance in the state of California. So now instructional materials funds are very flexible in California. Uh, there is one other piece, though. There are lottery funds available specifically for instructional material purchases in California. That totals around 245, 248 million a year. Uh, the state also during the recession suspended adoption calls for several years. Uh, however, it has recently called uh, for new adoptions in two subjects, first mathematics and then reading uh, uh, language arts. Moving on uh, to the southeast, uh, number two, Florida has also seen some changes in its adoption system. Uh, Florida continues to require districts to buy from the state board list. However, uh, districts may expend 50 percent of their instructional materials allocation on non-adoptive material. Also, a new requirement in Florida will require that districts expend 50 percent of their allocation on digital materials, uh, so it must be digital, starting next year, school year 2015, I'm sorry, this year, it's in effect, 2015-16. A third state that had a significant shift, obviously, is this one, Texas, which in 2011 enacted Senate Bill 6. As you know, the bill created a new instructional materials allotment, which provide, provides districts with more flexibility in how and what they purchase. A fourth state worth mentioning has had a significant change in its adoption process, and that's Louisiana. Earlier this year, Louisiana enacted legislation that creates a new rolling system of digital uh, reviews that uh, districts will look at. And then finally, there's just uh, two or three states, or maybe more than that, that really have not covered, uh, recovered from the uh, recession or where their state adoptions haven't recovered from the recession. North Carolina, for example, the instructional materials fund there was cut early in the recession and has not recovered. It was a devastating cut of more than 75 percent and it still simply has not uh, come back. Uh, also, the state to the north here, Oklahoma, made its funding for instructional materials very flexible. Uh, during the recession, that flexibility uh, still continues, even though there is an adoption process in Oklahoma. 
So as you can see, there's been a great deal of change in state adoptions uh, for a variety of reasons and a variety of pressures uh, over the past five to six years. I expect that state adoptions will continue to evolve as products evolve and new technologies and new styles of learning change uh, the market. And that is my presentation, Madam Chair. Fantastic. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. Um, my name is John Dragoon. I work for Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. In fact, you might say um, I'm employed by them. We'll see if this, this uh, clicker works. I'm always the first guy in the afternoon. There we go. So I'm employed by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. I say employed because, uh, like all of you, uh, and this seems to be a little tricky, it's always, uh, I guess, um, that's going to be problematic. Uh, like all of you, here's who we work for. We work for the 4 million students, 50, 55 million students in the United States, the 5 million of which are in Texas, the 4 million teachers. So this is an industry that's very mission-driven, and our company is no different. In fact, uh, there's, you're going to find a fair amount of pattern recognition in the thoughts I'm going to share with you over the next eight minutes or so in the conversation this morning. And I guess in that, uh, there's, there's comfort in knowing that we're actually looking at the same side of the apple. Uh, if you look at the questions that were posed to us by the board, I think they can be summarized in these six words. If you look at all questions across all, all modalities, the question becomes, the challenge becomes, how do we enable learning in a changing landscape? How do we enable learning in a changing landscape? And for us, it's not so much about a digital transformation, but it's about a learning transformation. And so the first part of this learning transformation is to have a point of view on what, in fact, is changing in the landscape. And the good news is a lot of these things have already been discussed this morning, whether it's the the, the high-stakes standards, the TEKS that we have to deal with, the uh, high-stakes tests around STAR and other things that are part of our, our learning environment, the technology that we have to integrate into all of our learning uh, disciplines from teacher all the way through student and parent, uh, the data that must not only inform instruction but make that a more effective outcome, uh, the competition that we all face not only as, as publishers and vendors uh, but as, as schools as well, all of it leading to an increasing array of choices that make all of our jobs, whether you're on the educator side, the uh, content side, or the consulting side, uh, more complex. And so the question is, how do you deal with that complexity? Uh, our answer to that is it takes an integrated approach, an integrated approach that not just my company or the companies that represent here today can do by themselves. And that integrated approach goes across these three dimensions, all of which you've, we've talked about this morning. Great content, technology that matters, that has purpose, and expertise at the scale of institution, teacher, student, and parent to take advantage of all three of these things. It's fair to ask, well, what <coughs> makes great content, particularly what makes great content in a digital learning environment? We have a point of view that great content has five common attributes. Interestingly enough, four of those attributes, Dr. Rue of Northwest talked about from the student perspective. We'll talk about the fifth in a second. The first attribute of great content is it ought to be interactive. We ought not be afraid of the way students learn and engage today uh, and embrace what they learn through games, apps, and social media and do that in a purposeful way from an interactive perspective. Second, great content ought to be adaptive. This, in large part, is the holy grail of content creation. How do we do what great teachers already do today and through uh, an intelligent use of data and information make that content interactive so that we can teach at the scale of individual student needs, learning styles, and, and preferences? Third, if it ought to be adaptive, it also ought to be portable. So we've talked about today that learning is no longer going to be confined to within the school walls, but sometimes on the way to the soccer game in the back seat on an iPad. So how do you make content that works where the student wants to learn and needs to learn, not just within the four walls of the classroom, but wherever they may be, whether that be in the school system or in an informal learning center? The flip side to portable, it ought to be accessible. A lot of conversation today about bandwidth and, and all that, and that's great but there are still areas of the country, still areas of Texas, where that total accessibility is not yet available. So when we create great content, we have to allow for the fact that that content at times will be consumed in an offline environment. How do we make that experience with that content persistent and consistent, whether that access is via an online or offline environment? And the first among equals among all great content is it ought to be effective. The first four don't matter if the content itself is not delivering a differentiated learning outcome. So we spend a lot of time on the learning science and how people learn and applying those disciplines to make content effective uh, above all, effective measured by uh, studies that we can all agree on uh, make a difference. That's the content story, but as you've heard today, content enough is not enough. Content without the right uh, set and portfolio of enabling services 
is sub-optimized at least. And we think of the services equation in education at three dimensions. The services at the scale of institution, those transformational services. The, the services at the scale of teacher, professional development services to take advantage of content and technologies. And the services at the scale of product, how to best get the most return from the products and content that you're doing. So it's part of that integrated solution. Content married with great services gives, gives us a fighting chance. Now, a couple of things that we're doing, uh, I think one of the things we're going to acknowledge first off is, well, we would all like the state of Texas to buy all its content from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. We recognize that that's not possible. So we have, to we have to participate in an ecosystem in a cooperative way. And one of the things we do this is through a developer portal. What that means in layperson's terms is opening up our technologies and our application program interfaces to ed tech developers who are creating great content that either we have chosen not to create or they could just do a better job than we can. So we're opening up our uh, application program interfaces through a developer portal to take advantage of the great content that comes from alternate sources, not just HMH. Likewise, you had a conversation together that a lot of times great content comes from students and teachers. Many of you may be aware of uh, an application or a portfolio called Teachers Pay Teachers. This is HMH's uh, answer to that, which is an HMH marketplace where we as a trusted curator and collector of content will provide a safe place for teachers, educators, and anyone who wants to exchange content in an, in an open way to participate in. So this is an answer that says we're going to open up our ecosystem, not just to ed tech developers, but to other people who are creating great content and hopefully marry it with ours. And then finally, uh, a vision for the future of education. I'm reminded that sometimes the difference between a vision and a hallucination is the due date, so we keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> But as we think about this, I think you'll see some common themes here. The first of which is, um, as this chart builds, and that's, uh, that's my neighborhood in Boston, uh, this notion that of content in the cloud. And why do we have that vision? Because uh, if learning is going to take place anytime, anywhere, we have to make content accessible via, via applications and technologies that matter. So the, one of the visions of technology in the future is access to information in the cloud in a very scalable way. The second notion of this... Uh, vision of the future, and I guess I'm too, is this notion of dynamic content. We've had a lot of conversation today about buying content and then holding it for six to eight years. We do not be believe that's the vision and future of education. We propose uh, that content needs to be dynamic, it needs to be uh, updated constantly to take advantage of new elections, new, new discoveries, new facts, new figures, and so content in the future in education will be dynamic. It will be dynamic and independent of time and location. So we go back to portability and accessibility being two of, two of the five attributes of great content. In the future, learning will be, take place independent of time and location. Content ought to be as well. The fourth vision is this notion of personalized. And we had a conversation this morning about the difference between learning styles and learning aptitudes and preferences, whatever you want to call it, this notion that what great teachers do intuitively, technology and content ought to help, help in that conversation in terms of making making it more personalized. <coughs> we had a definition and conversation this morning about what does success look like. We believe in the future success is not measured by seat time, but by competency-based learning or mastery. And so the way we test, the way we assess, and the way we deliver educational content needs to take into account the difference in the, in the definition of what success in the future looks like. And we believe that future is based on competency and mastery of skills. And then finally, a lot of conversation this morning about privacy. I think we ought not be fearful of what that allows for, but embrace it with thoughtful conversation and discussion. So, yes, all of us at this table are going to promote privacy. HMH is one of the early signers of the Software and Information Industries Act on Privacy. We fully believe in that, but we, we have to embrace it in a thoughtful way, and we believe that a, a digital learning identity is part of what will allow for a personalized learning environment. Finally, you asked a question at the end about what should Texas be doing over the last five years. We've talked about these things briefly, but readiness. Readiness for, for us at the scale of human capital. Human capital uh, from educators all the way through, <coughs> through uh, teachers and students. Security we've talked about. Infrastructure we've talked about. Not the glamorous infrastructure on one device for everybody, but the behind-the-scenes plumbing that was talked about today. Don't shortchange yourself on that. Parent engagement, we think that's something that's extremely important that we all have to unite around. Let's not forget that parents are as afraid of this digital transformation as most of the rest of us. They're not, most of them are not digital natives either. We have to equip them to be able to be part of this conversation and solution. And then finally, a focus on quality. Let's have a robust discussion about the time and place for open education resources, but never lose the focus on what quality content uh, needs to deliver a differentiated learning outcome. Richard. Thank you. Thank you.
My name is Richard Keevney. I'm the Vice President of Technology Product Development at McGraw-Hill Education. Uh, I'm an education technologist. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak with you. It's an honor to be here. I have a few slides and I will pick up on some of the themes that, that we heard this morning around the science of learning serving the art of teaching. The, it couldn't be a more exciting time to be a learner today. The opportunity to have personalized learning is incredible. Uh, and education is changing. That is the point of, of the day today, and we're hearing it. But there are parts of education that don't change. Education is still very much a purposeful activity. It is for purpose that you do it. And education is truly about unlocking the full potential of each learner. Technology is a tool to help us. Uh, it is not the panacea, because fundamentally, uh, learning is driven by great teachers. It always has been and always will be. I've made educational technology for 20 years, and I've never made a piece of technology that has taken, uh, taken the role of a teacher. It, it helps teachers do those things. But there is, there is a science to learning. Uh, we talked uh, this morning about some examples of great teaching and the way that teaching is done. There's a science to how we learn. This morning we learned about memory de degradation and how you reintroduce a topic to somebody right before they, they're about to forget it. That's part of the science of learning. I, I'm part of a thousand uh, person group focused solely on technology and, and science of learning. And what I'll share with you today are some of our adaptive technologies, the engines, that allow for personalized learning. Because we, we as just one provider, have thousands of digital products. We have millions of users. And we have billions of small data points. And it's important. We don't collect data like we've heard some concerns around um, a child's identity. We don't collect that data. We don't need it. Uh, what we do is we map our content in a way that's a scope and sequence, and then we take micro, micro assessments at the point of learning where each child is, and we use that data, small data on their learning moments that have nothing to do with what the child's name is or where they're from. We don't collect that data. We collect small data. And the reason we collect small data is because we have subject matter experts, learning and data scientists, and engineers that can use that data to build better products, and ultimately to make better content. We make assessments of our own content and our own products and improve them. Because we fundamentally are in a, a world that is, is twofold for us. It's, very, it's both print and digital, and we have to ride both horses. We don't see the book going away. Um, this was homage to Texas. I, I, um, I don't know how to ride a horse. Um, Is that you? So I don't know if that's doing it well. But the idea that, there, that print doesn't go away. Print is an important modality. But it isn't the best way necessarily to get personalized learning. If I were to collect all of us into a classroom and teach us calculus, the best way for me would to be first understand where each of you are in calculus and then give you a little bit of personalized attention so that we all move ahead, not as, as we heard this morning. At the end of the day, you don't know whether or not that student is doing well. And it's important because education is important. When I, uh, one of the, a very moving story I'll tell you, uh, years ago I was at a school. It was in a, a mall, a strip mall, upstairs above a store. And the school was preparing uh, people to become nurses. And in that school, I walked in to show them how to use my technology. The computers were all lined up. They're connecting through cables from the roof. Each of those people in that room had at least one child with them, often sitting with them, playing on the floor. Each of those people were purposely trying to do something to better themselves in their lives. That didn't have to be technology. It te te not that technology helped them. But the idea that we are able to provide part of the solution. The teacher was still the key. The institution was still the key. But when we make technology, the key parts and, and part of the standards that we're establishing is that when that student is sitting there to learn calculus because they want to be a nurse, or if they're trying to learn calculus because they want to graduate from high school, the content, the tools should be engaging, they should be easy to use, they should be efficient, and they should be effective. And a recommendation for, for the state of Texas, which is the most important state for education. People look to the state for the guidance. 
part of the standards to, to be established for deciding whether or not the technology is working should be at least partly based on things like this, not just whether or not it, it has all the technical requirements. Because the learning moment is the most important thing. The learning moment is, as we heard this morning, right when you're ready to learn something, give that person that thing that they're most ready to learn. That's what great teachers do. When we do that, we use, that, we use our learning science, but we don't see ourselves as the only solution. Uh, much like HMH, we see ourselves as part of a solution, so we build on open standards. There's IMS Global as an open standards body that we support. Uh, it's a nonprofit, and that is one way to drive that all of your technology partnerships will work together. <clears throat> Things like LTI and Caliper and QTI, all standards, in the same way that when, when email first came out, every email provider locked you into their system and you couldn't email somebody else. There's a standard now. Now emails talk to each other. Same with cell phones. When you first had your cell phone, you were locked into that system. If you drove out of that system, you had no cell phone. Now there's a regulation that says it all interoperates now, regardless of your vendor. Because education is about, about moving every student forward, and every student learns differently, as, as we know from all the research, including research by an uh, educational psychologist named Benjamin Bloom, who said that students who receive one-on-one -on -one instruction can, can get the furthest ahead. And he has a, a famous graph that, that's called the Two Sigma problem. If we take a normal distribution of how students succeed in classrooms today, any classroom, a normal distribution looks like this, where most people get along okay, in the middle. What Bloom's research shows is that when you move from conventional learning, the bell curve, and you start providing mastery learning, and then ultimately one-on-one -on -one learning, that's when you move everybody over to success. Technology can help with that. In this case, technology can provide those small pieces of micro-assessments. So if you were to ask me, what, what is the, the radius of a circle? I can tell by how I answer my own question in the software whether or not I really get it. That micro-assessment helps me get one-on-one -on -one tur uh, tutoring that's going to be different from anybody else in this room. The teacher's still involved. The student has to be an active participant, but the technology can provide that level of small detail, small data. Because ultimately, education is local. It will always be the most successful when you have the local, the local person doing good things with the best technologies. And that's what we hope to partner to. Thank you. Scott. <clears throat> thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, board members. Thank you very much uh, for having us today. My name is Scott Kinney with Discovery Education. I've been uh, at Discovery for 10 years now. Uh, prior to joining Discovery, I spent 15 years in public education uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, I'm incredibly excited to be here today. And, and uh, in large part, I'm excited to be here uh, to steal a phrase from Malcolm Gladwell because I believe we're at a tipping point in education. Uh, I believe that today we have the tools, the resources, the technology to fundamentally change uh, the way we support what we know about great instructional practice. Uh, and, and so if we utilize those resources, I, I believe that we can meet the needs of our diverse learners across this country in a way that's effective, in a way that's efficient, and in a way that can scale. Uh, and we're starting to see that across the country. I mean, one of the things uh, that uh, as we look across the landscape of public education in the U.S., we see this, this notion of connectivity. Uh, Future Source tells us that uh, this is the first school year where half uh, of the U.S. K-12 population will have access to one-to-one -one computing. Uh, this is a, an interesting research study that came out about two weeks ago from COSIN and AASA. Two years ago, they asked high schools if they had wireless connectivity. Uh, two years ago, uh, there were 43 percent that said they did not. Today, that statistic is 1 percent uh, of high schools that are reporting that they do not have wireless connectivity. Uh, it's the first year that Simba and EMR report that teachers today will be utilizing more digital content in their classrooms than traditional print. And if we look at the trend of assessments, uh, a recent uh, research report just came out from EdTech Strategies that talks about elementary and middle schools across this country for the first time this year will actually take more assessments uh, via technology than they will in pen and paper. But 
this is really the question for us, in, in my mind, is why? So we're here to talk about digital content, and I think the question that we have to answer is, what's at the center of this? And, and in my mind, it has to be our students, and it has to be what's right for them and how do we support their learning. So there are three things I'll, I'll touch quickly on today. Uh, one is that we know that today's generation of learners fundamentally interacts with content differently than any previous generation of learners. And so uh, Common Sense two weeks ago came out with their research study that talked about how much time kids spend with media. So teenagers 8 to 18, nine hours a day uh, with media. Now do the math. If you multiply that by seven, because they don't take weekends off, it's over 60 hours every week uh, that they're spending with media. What's interesting is the footnote on this, which is that doesn't include time in school or time doing homework. Uh, and so we see a generation of learners that's fundamentally interacting with content differently. And it's not just in the US. Across the world, you, you know, uh, one of the things that we see is about 20% of kids today, uh, ages 2 to 5 in a number of different countries, can use a smartphone application. Less than 10% of them can tie their own shoes. Uh, and so we really are <coughs> dealing with a generation of students, no different in Texas. So in Texas, when you look at the, the ELAs around uh, your, your state standards, the TEKS, uh, the words technology and media appear over 140 times. Um, and it doesn't stop in our K-12 classrooms. Right? So we talk about college and career ready. If we want kids to be college and career ready, if you look at the Fortune 500 companies across this world, how do you get a job? You apply online. And so the majority of our companies like Walmart and Target, you have to make those applications online. And in fact, Rand did a study and talked about what are those must-haves for employees, the two top things that rise to the top, social skills and digital literacy. And so how do we begin to really prepare our students today for the world that they're entering tomorrow? The second thing is with digital content, and this has been talked about quite a bit, I think all the content providers will, will talk about this notion of access to, to current and relevant information. What does this fundamentally mean to the kids in, in classrooms across the state of Texas? So if you think about an eight-year adoption cycle and you have an eight-year-old textbook, you know, what are the things that might not be represented in there or might be factually incorrect? I think the easy one is that we still think George Bush is president of the United States. Uh, and so maybe a bad example here in the state of Texas, but um, the idea is we can update our content regularly. We can provide updates. We can reflect new standards if standards happen to change uh, and keep those alignments intact. But the most important thing from my perspective uh, is this notion, is how do we begin to meet the needs of every learner within our classroom, regardless of where they are in that learning continuum or how they choose to learn. And so one of the things that uh, we heard a lot about today was this notion of learning styles. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the learning styles and then uh, I'm going to just use a quick example to illustrate um, how I think we can use learning styles within our instructional process. So two weeks ago, I, I had the, the opportunity to speak with uh, curriculum directors across the state of Texas at Texas ASCD. <clears throat> and during that presentation, I asked this question. I said, when you walk around your school systems, how do you see instructional content primarily delivered? And here's what they said, right? So I didn't make this up. This is their answers. Uh, they said primarily lecture by, by a long shot. Uh, and the least was media. And then text and hands-on were somewhere in the middle of that. About 30 minutes later, I asked the same audience. I said, Tell me how you best learn, recognizing that we're all a combination of these things, right? That we're not just one of them. But if you had to choose one, are you an auditory learner? Are you a read-write learner? Are you a visual learner? Far and away, people said they were visual learners. And incidentally, the, the least number of folks said auditory. And I happen to be an auditory learner, but I always know that I sit kind of in that, that minority. So what's interesting is for about two years uh, amongst educational groups, I've asked this question in some form or fashion. And here's the information that I've gotten back uh, when I've asked it. When I ask, how do you see instructional content delivered, it's not much different than what I saw uh, in, in Houston a couple weeks ago with educators here in Texas. Primarily, people say lecture, then text. The next one is hands-on, followed by media. When you ask the second question, how do you consume information or how do you prefer to consume information, here's what people say. A quick glance at this will tell you that the way we deliver instructional content in this country is the complete opposite of how we typically consume information. Uh, so we, we literally could not design it worse if we were to start from scratch. Now the idea is not, to be clear, the idea is not if I'm an auditory learner, the only thing I do with that learner is lecture to them. 
We are, we're multimodal learners. We learn in different ways. And I'll give you a quick example, because I, I was thinking of the gentleman's comments this morning. My youngest daughter, Reagan, plays soccer. How did she learn to play soccer? Well, certainly at some point she read about soccer, but she couldn't just stop at reading about soccer. She also had to go out and play soccer. She also had to listen to her coach talk about soccer strategy. She also, as part of her assignment, watched the soccer on TV. And so the idea is how do we start to stimulate students in a number of different ways through digital content. And so I put this up as an example, not because it's high tech or, or something that um, illustrates the latest technology, but I put it up as an example as a learning object that at face value meets the needs of a visual learner. But as you start to deliver this digitally, we can start to do different things. We can interact with this content. And so I can meet my kinesthetic learners or students who want to learn by doing. I can support this once that once this um, uh, goes into place, you'll see some text that supports this learner. Uh, I can hit this play button, and if there were speakers, you'd hear this being read to you, and I can speed up and slow down that text, or I can read it in different languages. And so the idea is how do we begin to empower teachers with <clears throat> content that really helps them, again, effectively, efficiently, and at scale meet the needs of all their learners in their classroom. So I'll just end with uh, a couple questions um, that, if I were you, I, I would be asking us. Right? And so these are kind of a short list of questions that you might want to ask your digital partners as, as school systems across Texas make this transition to digital. Uh, one is, was it digital by design? So a lot of the folks that you're, you're hearing from today, when they talk about these tools and technologies, uh, are building them from scratch. And so is it simply a textbook that's been PDF'd, as we heard earlier from, from Dr. Rue, I believe? Uh, or are we really designing this from scratch to take advantage of, of digital? Uh, how do you intend to support educators making this transition? This is a transition. It is a paradigm shift. So what is your strategy as an educational partner to support educators as they make this, as well as the rest of the educational community? Uh, how do you update your materials? And so that becomes an important, important part of it. And frankly, as a pure digital provider, we don't ship things. We don't warehouse things. We don't print things. It should be cheaper. And that should be an expectation. And you should ask those questions. Thank you very much for your time. Jeff. Madam Chair uh, and uh, members of the board, uh, we, uh, our company appreciates the opportunity to uh, be here in front of you and, and, and be on uh, the panel with uh, these gentlemen. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm here to move the conversation along figuratively um, and um, also um, um, I don't have a presentation or a statement. Uh, we are an ed tech publisher in career and technical education. We spend a lot of time in schools and we've participated in a lot of adoptions across the United States, including the state of Texas. So I'm here to answer any questions you may have. We did respond to your question document and we'll supply you with that uh, as well. Thank you. Mark. Hello. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for having us in today. My name is Mark Nelson. I'm Vice President of Technology Product Management for Pearson Learning Services. And I wanted to spend some time just going over some recent data points, as recent as this back to school season. Um, one of the things that we see right now in this space is the environmental factors that support digital delivery of content are changing rapidly. Uh, relatively inexpensive devices are proliferating. Uh, these devices are Wi-Fi enabled, they're solid state storage, they're compact in size. Um, that's driving one-to-one -one initiatives uh, and some of the recent stats you already heard. But one-to-one -one initiatives, why that's so important is it's driving a difference in the way digital content is consumed in the classroom. More and more of the school day is consumed by digitally delivered content. These interactions can be more sophisticated than they have been in the past. Less passive consumption of media and more about substantive interactions. Overall usage of digital materials is up significantly. Five, six years ago, we began to see the first trends in that, and it was around assessment. Uh, there was limited devices in a school. People would go down to the lab. Uh, they, they felt it purposeful to give assessments. That data was rolled up and used for decision making. Now with the proliferation of devices and broadband, we're seeing teachers uh, deliver digital lessons at scale for the first time. So for example, 
in, since August 24th when school started here in Texas, uh, the Pearson Realize platforms seen 18.5 million sessions delivered. Those sessions average in 8 to 10 minutes in length. 22% of those sessions are in Texas. There are 1.5 million unique users in, that, in this relatively new system. 26% are in Texas. What are these, what are these uh, folks doing? Well, one of the things, uh, one small stat, um, we, we understand all the content that's being consumed. We understand the proficiency of how the content's being consumed, how the students are moving towards mastery. Um, but one example would be 13 million math engagements were delivered in one month, in the month of September. We saw a trend that started August 24th and continued up until about September and is now leveled off Within the state of Texas, about 129,000 students are getting assignments and completing those assignments digitally every week. And that's remained constant week over week. A very different use pattern than what we'd have seen in previous systems and iterations. Part of that is the platform itself is no longer constrained to deliver to a small range of specific devices. As a matter of fact, since back to school started, 1,142 different device and operating system configurations have accessed content on Pearson Realize. That's a daunting number. And as, as a publisher of digital content, one of the significant tasks we face. Uh, Bring Your Own Device um, has opened up uh, the doors to, uh, to many, many, many different device types and situations that we have to support. And it's not just uh, browsers and operating systems, it's screen size and location of buttons. And all these add complexity. But one of the great things about digitally consumed content is data. We released a new uh, K-12 reporting system for back to school this year. Uh, the early reports were just around usage, what students and teachers were doing. In the month of September, 39,000 reports were pulled. This is an on-demand service. It just broadened with the last release to, at school or district level, for school and district administrators to be able to, at the click of a button, drill down on a dashboard and see all of their students' progress towards mastery if they're consuming digital content online. So that's a huge driver to, uh, to this and a huge promise being fulfilled. I'm going to click this button. But it's not without its challenges. Um, you know, as we think about digital content delivery, the demand is certainly there. Uh, that's why we got invited to speak here today. But the infrastructure still lags behind. And there are, in addition to that, there are unique <coughs> characteristics about delivering bandwidth and high, you know, high density bandwidth in schools. Um, you know, first of all, if you look at an average office, the office I work in out in Phoenix, we had about 450 people spread liberally over three floors. Go down the street to the nearest high school in Mesa, there's 2,400 students in there. Those 2,400 students also do something very different than we do. They're on the clock. Their first click is almost guaranteed to be timed at the bell. And their last click. So we have concurrency, where everybody's rushing to that same pipe at the same time. So it's a unique environment with it, with, you know, where we need unique solutions. You add to that other system complexities. Um, Bueller, Kansas initiated a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, initiative this year. Small district, um, Mac Airs at high school, iPad minis at middle school, hand-me-downs at elementary uh, from across the district before. So they were having challenges implementing their one-to-one. -one. They, uh, they had a support person for two high schools, a couple middle schools, four or five um, elementary schools. They had put in the infrastructure, uh, but the devices were all new. The teachers were new to the devices. So they were, they were struggling to, to get their system up. It, we sent a technician and a consultant there for a two-day period. In that two-day period, we were able to resolve all of their outstanding issues, up to 98% of their issues, were things that were environmental in nature. They had old Wi-Fi hotspots that, that their users had used the previous year that their systems remembered. So they were going to the wrong pipe. Um, they had just simple device issues, things they didn't understand. Maybe they, they, well, they did have a caching system, and they hadn't whitelisted the appropriate sites. So it appeared as though the software was broken. These are all complexities that are hard to deal with and things that we have to be upfront about if we're going to make this work at scale. Um, 
Then add to that all this, all this talk about digital, offline access is imperative. It's got to be there. But the trade-offs are the more sophisticated interactions, adaptivity, the ability to gather um, you know, large amounts of data from each interaction online to report that in real time, uh, social interactions like discussion boards, shared files, all of those things require connectivity. So when you design products knowing that they have to be used offline, you have to be able to signal to the user very strongly, hey, you're offline, you can do these things, they'll persist, your teacher will be able to see them when you're online, here are the things you'll be able to do. So all things that we need to and are focusing to address. Finally, uh, we see since the beginning of the school year broad adoption of technology standards. Uh, I just listed a whole bunch of acronyms up there, um, but at the end of the day, we see increased adoption of IMS standards. Um, they're being driven by a consortium of schools in Florida, being driven out of HISD here in Texas, and other large districts. We see growth in the learning management sector. Um, schools are making a decision, Moodle was mentioned earlier, Canvas, it's learning, are making a decision to put in a standardized learning management system that can be used over a period of years where everybody that's using in the district has the same patterns of use. So it becomes familiar to them. The content may change, new content's purchased and it's served through this learning management system, but the training year over year becomes more stable. Um, and finally, probably one of the biggest things that uh, changes is direct integration with publisher systems and learning management systems with student information systems. I said, I told you guys about the change in uh, usage from August 24th to September 14th, we saw it spike and then level off. That's because this year, we integrated 500 districts with uh, SSO and roster synchronization, enabling teachers and students to begin using content at day one. Thank you. Questions, members? Surely you guys have some questions. Oh, I, I my oh you did? Oh, sorry. Well, no, I just now passed Ms. Cargill. It. Okay, so. I can't thank you enough for being here. So, and the name tags help so much. So, Scott, I think I heard you say in my notes that digital cost should have brought the price down for instructional materials. Wait, who said that? Did y'all move somebody? Oh, his head was down. Okay. So. <laughs> was that Scott or Richard that said that? Scott. Scott. I'm that one. Okay. <laughs> Gotta keep your head up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Could you elaborate on that? Because I am at, or maybe other board members are too, but when I go out and speak to my constituents, I am asked that question. And I do not have a good answer because I know that um, when Senate Bill 6 was passed in 2011, that was a big part of the conversation that the cost of instructional materials would come down if we went digital, but, but they haven't. So, yeah. so I'll, I'll, speak for my, okay. I'll speak for myself and our, our own organization, not for others. Um, you know, we, we were never a traditional publisher. We never printed anything. Um, so when we create, uh, you know, what, what you might refer to as a digital textbook, we did that from the ground up in a digital environment, um, which means that there are costs that we don't have, right? We don't have to warehouse things. We don't have to ship things. We don't have to print things. Uh, and so when you look at the cost of uh, one of our services, I think at the, at, for an eight-year adoption um, at the K-8 level, it's about $55. About a third of that cost is actually professional development. Uh, and so um, we embed professional development for educators within every purchase, if you will, of our digital textbook solution, um, which is relatively less expensive than, than tr traditional books would be, if you will. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that as a starting point, uh, when you are in a digital environment and you're not encumbered by traditional business practice, that you should be able to charge less for that service uh, and, and, and embed different things like professional development within that process. So for us, that became, you know, embedding that PD in there became critically important. As I mentioned during my remarks, um, it is a fundamental shift in the way that kids are or the teachers are interacting with their students. Um, and we think we just have to support them in that process. And so that becomes part of that uh, purchase as well. You can jump in. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to yeah. just add a different perspective on that's that. What, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd like for y'all to um, take a stab at that. Uh, and our perspective is we offer, you want an all-digital package to a hybrid, we offer it all. If you wanted all-digital and you were not 
been covered by any physical at all, it's 85% of our cost. So our cost is less for all digital. But you know, there's an interesting dissonance between what people actually say they want and what they actually install. So we thought people would adopt our all digital package at a, pr a much higher rate than they adopt it, including in Texas, by the way. Less than 3% of all districts adopt an all digital package. We'd be fine if they did that, and it would indeed cost less. But as my colleague said, most people actually implement a hybrid decision because of the requirements of both print and physical. As to the cost to develop, the, the print packaging and binding that he refers to is about a small percentage of the cost. It actually costs uh, quite a bit of money to, to create digital content if it's something more than a PDF representation of the physical content. What you want in digital content is videos, you want additional data, you want, you want all the other things that cost money to innovate around. So uh, I would not get um, sidetracked by the print printing equation, because that's frankly a small part of the overall cost of creating content that matters in terms of digital environment. And I would say if you want it all digital, we could certainly deliver it less, but that's not okay. what people are installing. Yeah, and I want to add to the question since we're, you're all answering, because when I look at the, the order summary of what uh, districts are purchasing by publisher, I mean, you're right, they're ordering bundles and they're ordering print, they're ordering um, the, the digital, they're getting discounts with purchases of two other types. I mean, it's like a whole recipe of things that are, which will be another question is how are the bundles and discounts and all of that determined? So I'm adding that to I want to give Richard a time to question. maybe. Oh, if you want to answer that question. Go ahead. So, <laughs> I, I I'm, a tech, I'm a technologist. I, I don't know. I, I'd have to get back to you on how that. I, I, I know. So, yeah, but in that. terms, I, I, so I want to answer something I don't, I don't know. But in terms of how the costs of development, there are costs in digital. Uh, the, the print side is very efficient. The actual printing of it is a small portion. The warehousing costs money. Where, where a lot of costs come is in the, in the way that we currently sell our products. Uh, the fact that we have a large sales force, the fact that we have to hand deliver things, the fact these, there's a lot of inefficiencies in our system that need to be addressed that aren't a decision between using a learner using something print or digital. There's inefficiencies in how this whole thing works. Unlike, unlike a, a pure software company, where if we wanted to go off and, and have a, a business relationship with Google, you wouldn't see anything printed, right? Because that is, a, that is a fully digital solution. They wouldn't be anything warehoused. You would be able to go out and buy it yourself. Uh, there are a lot of inefficiencies in the system that drive up the cost outside of whether we print it or not. And one last part is that really, really efficient content uh, is not inexpensive to make. We heard this morning from the districts where they have to, uh, they're, they're trying to find ways to pay quality educators to make content. Um, so that part is something that I would like, I'd like to make sure that we, we give deference to the people who are making the content who are experts at it. I'll add a little bit to that because um, similar to Scott, we are, are a video-based company and our curriculum has always been video-based. And, you know, for us being a small company, there was a lot of technology that we had to internally uh, build up to be able to deliver a product of this nature. So there were some costs initially for us. But what it was able or allowed us to do is make it a more efficient product for our customer on the other end. We were able to deliver it uh, more product at a more efficient cost annually. So we were able to package it differently to where I think it is less expensive for our customer. Hi, I would just add to the conversation um, that some of the differences, again, between, uh, again, not PDF content, but digital content that's alive year over year is, uh, for example, it was mentioned earlier in the, it was mentioned earlier in the um, conversation that we're facing uh, new data privacy legislation from uh, 34 states and growing. Um, those are those are not uh, requirements that come cheap. I mean, we're talking about the capability of being able to return a district's data by request, and then ensure by audit that we've removed all of that data from all of our systems and wherever it touched. That would be one example. I think the others is. Uh, other benefits that you get as far as being able to report on progress towards mastery, being able to roll up that data to the important decision makers at the classroom level, at the school and the district level. Um, so I do think there are, uh, in addition to the costs already mentioned, there are, there are other investments that are being made in digital content. Jay, I don't know if you could talk about the bundling part of it. it you know, just as a general conversation, you know, no one's going to discuss their specific bundles, but, you know, uh, if you could kind of address that, because I know you looked into that. 
unfortunately, associations uh, really can't really can't deal with uh, product features, right. pricing. Uh, there's federal laws that keep our activity at the trade association devoted to the, to the larger industry concerns, policy, legislation, regulatory. Uh, frankly, I know very very little about bundling. It's something that. Uh, companies specifically uh, can't answer. Can, can you reframe the question, Madam Chairman? I'll be happy to answer it. The, the specific question on bundling you want answered? Well, it's just that we, we hear um, so often that people end up having to take resources that they aren't, can't use in order to get this other resource that they want. Then we hear issues with, okay, in order to order a teacher edition, you got to buy 20 of the student editions. You can't just order extra teacher editions, you know, because you've got, you know, Where? groupings that you have to buy. So, I mean, just things like this that make it very cumbersome and, and expensive and difficult for d districts mm -hmm. to deal with. And they got to warehouse materials that, you know, they can't really use. And, and so, I mean, you just end up having all kinds of issues like that. Yeah, so our, our response, H.M. Mitchell, let my colleagues, is we've created four fundamental bu bundles around all digital to all hybrid plus services. And what we've tried to do within Texas is to identify what we think are going to be the most likely combinations that the districts are going to want. One suggestion we would have with related to, to the EMAT system is to allow people to go off off of these prescribed bundles that are in EMAT to do a la carte purchasing so they wouldn't have to buy things that they don't need. So that's one of the modifications in the current procurement system, the current EMAT system, that would allow for a little more flexibility in the way uh, in the way your districts are purchasing. Yeah, and they've got the ability to do that now. But it's uh, more expensive. Yeah. It's a little more expensive. It's a little more expensive. It's a bit a of a workaround. Expensive. I've done it. <laughs> it's a lot more expensive. Yeah, yeah you're in it. Uh -huh. Ted, add on a couple of things with my constituents. First of all, my background is technology. And so I think the answer to both my questions is yes, but I want to hear from you. One thing I like, uh, when I first came to the board, Chairman Miller was there. And the first time I ever saw any board everywhere look at errors to publishers. And we, Tynesy, Geraldine, we had we had the first time I ever saw anyone do it with this board charging for errors. But what I like about digital, I think, you tell me, and I'm, again, I'm not leading the witness to believe the answer to both my questions is yes. And we find errors or problem with links or anything else, or uh, I would think the blessing of the digital would be something you could address with release 1.1 1 .1 or 1 1.2 right away. Is that a true statement? And here's the here's the big elephant question. Because of the question given by constituents, and you know the concern about Common Core. Forty-five states adopted, that's the big elephant. Recently, you know, Texas, Louisiana, Indiana, Kentucky, Oklahoma, many more were drop off. So the question would be, if, and I think digital, you can customize to area or state, especially if your area is 5 point million kids, 1,200 ISDs. So can digital, is there any problem we come back and we have concerns about math, geography, whatever, Common Core stuff? Isn't that fairly simple to disconnect and say on this version here, it's not there anymore? Yes. yes. The answer is all yes? No yes. question. Yeah. Absolutely. Got two questions and two yeses. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let, let Mrs. Miller go first since she hasn't asked a question yet. Um, I wondered if you all have noticed the current research on um, comprehension versus uh, reading the printed traditional print. And have you been seeing the research and then the technical, how the, uh, it's interesting, learning and retaining from the technical or the, uh, to this, digital, you know, that you don't absorb it or learn it as permanently as you do the traditional print. So are you all seeing that? Okay. All right. Don't you think that will have some kind of an impact maybe on uh, this direction, instead of everybody running down the road to get jump on the technology digital bandwagon, that you're talking about kids learning, wouldn't that uh, be pretty important? Yeah. And maybe encourage more research? The OECD report addressed that, that I sent you all a link to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this notion of um, 
digital and education is sort of bearing the lead. You know, uh, what we think about is how to create the greatest content we can, independent of the modality around which that content is delivered. And then how do we test for the efficacy around the learning outcome we hope to generate? And we don't do that by guessing or subjective nature. We do that by blind studies on all these modalities. So we can have fact-based discussions on what happens. And as it turns out, people learn differently, as you point out, and they retain differently. Uh, and so for us, uh, that's why we spend quite a bit of research dollars on efficacy on allowing us to have not a subjective conversation, but a fact-based conversation on does the content deliver the differentiated learning outcome we hoped it did, independent of its modality, and which modalities actually deliver better outcomes. And as it turns out, one size doesn't fit all. That's right. You're right. Uh, content, thank you for using the word content, okay? <laughs> uh, I'm getting tired, pardon me, of hearing people get the definition of content mixed up with devices, okay? So in Texas, just know that uh, we are big on content because of the Constitution. So let's keep that in mind, okay? Thank you. Would anybody else like to address that question? Yeah. I think Scott wanted to. Yeah, I, there is a, a bit of a misnomer, I think, with digital. I mean, one of the things that oftentimes, um, and even the, OE, the um, Economic Development Report talked about, People think that, you know, when we deliver content digitally that you'll walk into a classroom and you'll see 30 kids staring at an iPad all day long. Great instruction was never 30 kids staring at a book for six hours a day. Great instruction today is not 30 kids staring at an iPad today. I think the fundamental um, conversation is really around there, there is a better way to deliver instructional materials. And, and to your point, uh, Ms. Miller, I think one of the things that you'll see oftentimes when you walk into a quote unquote digital delivered content classroom is you'll see learning stations. And some of that digital content very might well be printed out and having there might be a reading station where kids are reading printed text. Um, but it happened to believe that that printed text got there through a wire uh, and was printed on a local printer. Uh, and so I think that, you know, we oftentimes have to think about um, the premise of digital content is, again, not just staring at a Chromebook all day long, but it is a, a rich learning environment that employs what we know about great instructional practice. It just happens that content is delivered digitally. It's a great question. It is a great question. The, the benefit of using technology in the aid of reading, either printed or digitally, is that you can use the data you collect asking questions, like great teachers ask questions. Good technology asks questions. So you get asked a question about what you just read. Whether you read it in printed form or in digital form, it's that type of interchange that technology allows you to have at a very micro level as students are learning. And then the benefit of having that data on you as a learner or me as a learner, I, uh, not identified in any way, but I know later on I'm going to ask you about that again, right when you're about to forget it. That's the benefit you can get using a device in addition to anything else. Uh, that's what great teachers do. They ask you questions right before the test to make sure that, oh, remember we talked about this. That's what technology does as well. So it, in, in very micro ways, in, in the aid of reading, not in the exclusion of it. Mr. I'm going to go ahead and probably address a little bit of an elephant in the room that uh, I think that certainly is on the minds of a lot of folks as we talk about a, about a, a dynamic content. And that's kind of a two-edged sword because one of the things is that we do have in a, in a an adoption process is is that that content is put out there for the whole world to see and people that want to see it they see it and that there's an expectation out there that once we adopt that that it stays relatively static because I will tell you that there's a, a bit of a crisis of trust as it relates to content and what it gets presented to children and so I guess my question to all of you is is that how do we how do we move forward and ensure in an era of dynamic content that we also maintain a level of transparency and, and, and that, that enables us to foster public trust. And can you kind of maybe speak to that? I think the uh, issue you identified is, is one that's an active discussion in nearly all of the adoption states. And I, I see uh, all of the states looking around for the solution. The, the, and it's simply a tension between dynamic content. Uh, it, well, there's also the tension of how often do you review how large instructional materials uh, staffs ought to be within your state agencies, et cetera. I don't think anybody has found the solution. 
I think they will, like most things uh, pertaining to adoption changes, they will slowly emerge. To have dynamic content that's constantly changing is probably not in the interest of anyone. But at the same time, static content is not necessarily in the in, uh, interest of uh, everyone. Uh, it's already been noted that dynamic content allows uh, the publisher to make quick changes in the case of uh, any number of things, a new scientific discovery, an error, an unfortunate error, et cetera. I think eventually you all will simply have to decide how many times dynamic changes will be made. Um, how many times would they be allowed? Is it uh, only for certain cases? You can change immediately for an error. But on the other hand, what sort of factual statements uh, that may be uh, uh, entirely correct and not in question, how often can those be changed? So it, it's an evolution in progress. One question. Did you have a follow-up? Just uh, and just a follow up too, and, and I know that I think that Scott, maybe that you kind of addressed this. Maybe all of you could just speak to that in terms of the compatibility issues between platforms. Is is that what do you what's going to be required to if a school district doesn't necessarily? I mean, in other words, is they find multiple platforms to address different content areas and different areas that they're working on. How do we how do we knit that together? So I I think the key is is having standards that are separate from any one provider or any one tool developer. So IMS Global is one standard that many of us mentioned. That's a, it's a nonprofit. Much like there's a standard for how cell phones talk, there should be a standard for how these platforms speak with one another. Uh, and I think that all of us on the panel are members of organizations that support that standard. And then ultimately, I think it's, it's um, the Texas State Board of Education's demanding that people adhere to standards and not have walled gardens but have interoperability that's going to be the key. Just to, just to uh, support that, I mean, one of the things I think you probably hear from everyone uh, from a content provider perspective is that we would love to have uh, a small number of standards to, to work with. Um, in the state of Texas specifically, we have 75 integrations with different LMS providers. Um, and it, it is because districts <coughs> have a disparate, no, it's a, a very fragmented market that people ask us to integrate into. Um, so it, it certainly isn't the, the content providers that are uh, trying to kind of create their own isolated areas. I think it really is uh, a certain set of standards are, would be fantastic to work within. Yes, uh, Ms. Beltre. Um, first of all, thank you all for your presentations today. Um, I was just curious to learn a little bit more about the professional development services that you provide to educators um, and just kind of looking at trends that uh, you guys have observed. What is, high, what is you know, highest demand uh, professional development? Uh, what are teachers requesting or what are districts requesting help with? Well, we, we divide professional development between program and practice. So there's a lot of professional development at the practice level, how to teach math better, how to teach ELA better, how to be a better, how to better integrate technology into my classroom, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole series and catalog of offerings that all of us probably provide with respect to practice. And then there are a whole set of professional development around program, program specific. I've adopted my program or one of these other programs. How do I get the most out of that program? And so we think of professional development at those two scales, program and practice. I would add, um, I mean, it's, it's almost cliche, but effective professional development, job embedded, relevant, uh, and ongoing. Uh, and so I think when we think about professional development last year, um, we delivered a little over 4,000 days of professional development. Over half of them were actually instructional coaching in the classroom side by side. Um, so we see that as a huge trend, that people want that ongoing support. Um, this is a, it, it is a shift in the way that, that we're asking teachers to engage with students. So I think one of the things that, that you have to be clear up, up front is if you're going to make this transition from print to digital, what do those supports look like on an ongoing basis? And so what do the next three years look like? Not, not the next two days or two weeks or the next uh, you know, professional development day, but what do the next three years look like? How are we going to support you in that practice? Okay. Did you want to ask? Well, I just, yep. So um, just to piggyback a little bit on what my colleague, Mr. Maynard, was talking about with the public trust, um, when I go in and speak to my constituents, and I have a feeling, feeling some other members have experienced this too, there is a lot of distrust about digital. And you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, those digital texts, but, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I get that because there is a big, big difference between them. And I'm, I, you know, certainly know that technology is coming, but sometimes I feel like when we, because I looked at a lot of the history textbooks last fall, and here I am, you know, middle-aged mom, 
figuring out, I was so proud of myself. I mean, I really figured out how to get in the books and the logins and the security and all that. But I was amazed by all the videos that were in there, which would be impossible for us to review all of the videos. Also, um, a lot of pop-ups. So what might be really, really evident on a printed page, you know, where it's right there and you can see all the content, you can't see it in the digital unless you click, 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 you know, and then it might pop up. And so my question to you is, how can we as a state where it's really, really critical for content to be reviewed, how is it even possible to review that? And then knowing that some things might change. Now, I know you can't change things that have been credited for TEKS coverage without going through the board and the commissioner. I, I, and you know that, right? You knew that. Okay, just make it sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what state am I in? What are our rules? What are the rules in Texas? Um, but so, you know, that, and, and, you know, there's been a lot of, of issues in the public recently and in the media about things that are showing up in digital that weren't apparent in the print or that was apparent in the print that took a gazillion clicks to get to in the digital. So it's a conundrum for us. Do you have any advice is my question. You're going to tell me to get a million more reviewers and more time and more money, right? But other than that, what can we do? <laughs> They're thinking. <laughs> okay, that silence is there, deafening there are, right there. Their there wheels are turning. I see them. <laughs> there, are, there are certainly, in the different categories that you bring up, some, some of broken links or inappropriate material, there are technologies you can use that can spider and make sure that those things don't happen. So you can take some of the, that work out, uh, but there's no replacement that I can think of for a, a, an informed human person looking at this saying that this is appropriate or inappropriate either in the content itself or the way you the way you discuss the pop-ups that's just very poor design yeah. uh, that, that a, a qualified human eye would see this is just terrible but would it be you could, but digital could quickly react to that though I would hope I mean yes, we had example we had a, experts had a book passed and our parents not the experts drilled down on it and it was an interactive map of the Middle East but one country was left out the experts didn't find that, but the parents did. It was Israel. Now, the publisher quickly found that and fixed that. So that next whatever version 1.1, 1 .1, I mean, so I hope, I'm hoping that means when we find errors, complaints, that it mean digital, that you would respond quickly to those and, and fix those things. That's what I'm hoping the answer is, that we could work with you, and when a problem, controversial, or a link in there is inappropriate, I think about the, the uh, pornography software and libraries, all the controversy there, well, that's you know, First Amendment stuff, whatever, but I hope that we could agree with you when we find things wrong. You would quickly detach that link or fix it or et cetera. I, with, with, when we find it, the answer is yes, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.